everyone. Today we're going to be learning about topographic maps. So we have, um, we've seen some topographic maps. We've talked a little bit about topography with our cross sections of our um, plate boundaries, but today we're going to get into reading and drawing a topographic map. So we will learn about um, elevation, gradient, and different patterns that you can see. Um, you are going to learn how to read and actually draw contour lines and vertical profiles of elevation maps. And we're going to look at scales and how map scales can help us to, to, to determine distances and gradients. Um, your lab in the past, it has not been everybody's favorite. It is a little bit tricky. Um, so I'm actually glad that you'll be able to have this video to come back to and watch over and over or go back to certain sections when you need to. Um, but please remember, always use the, um, the discussion spot or send me emails if you're stuck on the lab. You're going to have practice both drawing and reading contour lines and also uh, drawing vertical profiles. So what is a topographic map? It is a map of topography. So topography is the shape of the landscape on Earth's surface. So the actual um, height on Earth's surface. So if we have mountains, if we have valleys, plains, oceans, um, that is our topography. So bathymetry is what we call our topography when it's below sea level. So under the ocean, our topography is called bathymetry. It's essentially the same. So this image here has our topography overlaid also with our bathymetry. So we see the whole surface of the earth as if you were to have removed the ocean. So our topography can tell us a lot about our geology and our plate tectonics. As we know, this right here, we have our spreading center, mid-ocean ridge, mid-ocean ridge. We can see some really deep trenches along our subduction zones. Um, and then we can also gain a fourth dimension of time. So when we look at our 3D landscapes, I mean, when we look at our um, topography and see how it changes over time, we're really adding that fourth dimension, which is pretty cool. So when we map our elevation, we map with topographic maps or with digital elevation maps, uh, digital elevation models, which are called DEMs. So a topographic map is like this one here on the left, where we have all of these different contour lines. So we have topographic contours to tell us uh, the different shape and the different elevations of things on the surface. A DEM is actually uh, more like a grid and it uses colors. So it uses colors. It's more like a picture of the elevation. Um, this might be something you're a little bit more familiar with seeing. So for example, this picture here, this would be a DEM that we showed. It does not have contour lines. It actually uses color to show you um, the different elevations. So what we're going to do today is focus on our topographic maps, which uses... Um, topography contours. So topographic maps, there's the contours, the lines themselves, and then there's also the contour interval, so the space between the lines, and then the scale of the map. Those are kind of the key components. And what we're going to go through today is how to read a topographic map, um, how to draw a topographic map, and then also reading and understanding and drawing vertical profiles all of which go together quite nicely. So when we think about contour lines, we think about a line at a constant elevation. So everywhere along this line on our map is 1100, let's say the unit is feet. So this on the bottom would be our topographic map. This on the top is the actual like 3D model of our mountain. So everywhere along this line is 1,100 feet. So if you were to walk along this line, you would not be stepping up or down at all. You'd be walking completely flat because everywhere along this contour is 1,100 feet. Same here. Everywhere along this contour is 1,200 feet. So that's the second one. You're outlining everywhere that is the same elevation. So you'll notice where you have more contours, you have a higher 
um, elevation. Here there's only three, so we have a lower elevation. So the contour lines connect all of the points that have the same elevation. So when we talk about elevation, we talk about the distance from sea level, um, the distance in the vertical, so the vertical distance from sea level. So here in this picture we have um, the zero contour line, so the zero foot contour line would be the line of sea level. So everywhere that is above sea level is on one side of the line. Everywhere that is below sea level is on the other side of the line. So we're dividing what is above and below this contour by drawing it. So everywhere above this contour is above sea level. Everywhere below this contour is below. So you actually outline the different regions. Then you'll also see that this contour is the 100 uh, meter, con excuse me, 100 foot contour. So everywhere along this line is 100 feet, 100 feet in elevation. Just like you can see on this map here, the act or this picture, the actual picture up here where that 100 contour would be is much um, higher than here in our sea level. So when we draw our contour lines, we have to remember that the lines are always drawn at evenly spaced intervals. So if your um, the interval of your map is going to be the same throughout the whole map. Now the interval is not set. There's no constant. It can vary from map to map. It can be five feet. It could be 500 meters. It depends on what you're mapping. It depends on the map maker. But that interval will be constant throughout the whole map. You're never going to have a change of interval where on one side of the map your contours are 5 meters apart, then on the other side of the map they're 15 uh, meters apart. That would never happen. You're always going to have the same interval. One thing that is generally done in most topographic maps is uh, we highlight our index contours. So our index contours being every fifth contour. So it doesn't matter what the interval is, but we highlight every fifth one just for ease of reading the map, just so it doesn't look so much like a pile of spaghetti, honestly. We want to make it easier for the person reading it to actually understand. So you give them uh, an index contour to focus on. So if we go back, yeah, so this one has index contours as well. Um, at the 100 and the 200, see how these are heavier lines? That's what we do with our index contours. And you'll notice they are five lines apart. So every fifth contour on this map is going to be the heavier line. Just makes it easier to read. Depression contours. So if you ever see contours that have these dashes on them. It means that sort of the elevation has switched directions or that now you're looking at something that is decreasing in elevation inside of this closed circle. So a closed contour, meaning that the circle is fully complete. It's not a line like this one up here. A closed contour that has these dashes signifies that something's going down in elevation. So like a crater or a hole in the ground. So contour lines never, ever, 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 ever cross each other. You would never have um, the 110 contour cross across because that is not how our number system works. It might come very, very, very close if it's quite steep, but you'll never have contours crossing each other. I think that will un you'll understand that part more when you're actually drawing. Um, it, that will make a lot more sense. And there's no real beginning or end to a contour. So just because this line ends at the end of my map doesn't mean that the elevation stops. There's still land there. And generally, when you see a V-shape or a U-shape, you're looking at a valley or a river. So here's a river flowing into the ocean. We have this nice U-shape or V-shape. So that's pretty um, typical of a river valley. You'll notice, so this map here does not have index contours, but it does label your contour interval. Most maps will not label the interval because you can figure it out just from looking at the numbers that are labeled. So they have index contours labeled for you, but they are not in the um, heavier line or the thicker pen mark. But the index contours are the ones with the labels. So we can tell that the Contour interval is 20 meters because here we have 100 
and then four blanks, and then a 200. So it must be 100, 120, 140, 160, 180, 200, because they are always evenly spaced. So we know that they're always going to be the same distance between every contour on the same map. So here is uh, the same figure again, and now let's think about what would happen to this figure down here if sea level were to rise by 100 feet. What would happen is everything below 100 feet, so everything below this first index contour would be underwater. So you find your 100 foot contour, and then the new shoreline would be that 100 foot contour. So that's one way that um, you can think about these contour lines. So how do you read contours? You can think of them as uh, different planes. So the first one, maybe this is our sea level, is our blue, so our uh, zero meters, uh, sorry, this is in feet. Our zero feet would be this outer circle. So we know that where we have this outer circle is zero feet. So this is an island because here is underwater. So we have zero feet and then the um, elevation, the height keeps increasing. As we see, we go from zero to 20 to 40 to 60, which means the top of our mountain here is going to be somewhere over 60 feet but not quite 80 feet, or we would have had to draw another circle to signify something at 80 feet. Because these are spaced every 20 feet apart, we would have to have an 80 because it's always um, a constant interval. So if you were to walk this distance, you would also gain 20 feet in elevation. If you were to walk then to your 40 contour, you'd be gaining another 20 feet in elevation. So you're actually walking up this rather steep mountain. So here are some pretty good examples. So what we actually see on the flat map would be on the top and the 3D view is on the bottom. So you'll notice they do have index contours that are thicker, so the 1440. And this uh, mountain on the left has more contours. So they actually have a second index contour. This one over here doesn't have as many contours, which means it is not as tall. Otherwise, if they were the same height, you would expect the same number of contours. So how do you go about reading contours? Start with one that is labeled and then figure out the um, interval. And you can kind of interpolate in between. So here's our 200 contour, here's our 300 contour. So we know that our interval is 20. So if we were to say what is the elevation of x, we can say okay our interval is 20. I know this outer line is 200, so this must be 220, x must be right on the 240 line. If we were looking at y, y is not directly on a contour. We just determined, since this is 200, this is 220, this is 240, which means this next contour is uh, 260. So Y is somewhere in between 240 and 260. And I think it looks a little closer to 260. Uh, so maybe this is more like uh, 254, something like that, 255, closer to 260 than it is 240. So it really is, you're just interpolating in between the two contours. Z, we know would be something above 300, but it isn't quite at 320. If it were at 320, there would be another circle here denoting where on our map is at 320 elevation, whatever the unit is here. So when we are thinking about map scale, so map scale is how we convert our map into distances in the real world. So we've had a little bit of experience of, with this in some of our um, labs and we've done, we've used more of the graphic scale type of scale. So this is where you use the scale on the map to say, okay, this many 
This distance, let's say you measure in inches, is equal to 300 kilometers. And then you expand that out to determine the distance between, say, the uh, convergent boundary and the uh, island arc of mountains. I forget exactly what we've done in class, but I know you guys are very familiar with this graphic scale version of a map scale. So what I don't know that we have used yet is more of the ratio scale. So this is where one unit on your map, whatever it is, is equal to, in this example, 1,000 units in the real world. So if you measured in inches, one inch is equal to 1,000 inches, or one, one meter is equal to 1,000 meters. So it's a ratio scale. Whatever you actually measure on your map, you just scale it by this amount in the real world. So there's a couple different ways that uh, maps can display scale. And scale is something you're going to want to be familiar with when we start talking about gradient. Because a gradient, very similar to our uh, geothermal temperature gradient that we did in the very first day of class. Remember the change of um, temperature with depth down to the center of the earth? Our gradient, when we talk about topography, is the change in height with distance. So it's essentially the slope. So the change in elevation with distance is the slope. So a gradient can be used for any variable. So you can have a temperature gradient, you can have an elevation gradient. So what we're talking about here is just elevation. So it really is the slope of your mountain or the slope of your cliffside. So lines that are very close together, like on this side here, we see that we're gaining a lot of elevation in a rather short distance. Whereas on this side of this mountain, we see that we're gaining the same elevation over a very, very long distance. So this means you would have to walk this far in distance to get to that um, peak. So if you wanted a very gentle slope, a nice easy walk, you'd want to go on this side. If you were looking for more um, of a workout, you're trying to go uphill fast, you would want to walk on this side where it's significantly steeper. And we can tell because our, our contours are close together. So where the contours are close together is where we have that higher slope. It's where we have that higher gradient because the change in elevation is larger per distance. So the change in elevation per surface distance is our topographic gradient. So here, this is similar to what we looked at before. Here we see one mountain, here we see our other mountain, and we'll notice before I actually show you the three-dimensional view of these mountains is you see that this one on the left has more contours than this one on the right. So we know first off, okay, the one on the left is going to be taller. There's more contours. They start at the same, the same um, elevation and you go through more contours. Another thing to notice is on this left mountain is that the slope is going to be, uh, excuse me, the gradient is going to be higher on this side of the mountain. So this is going to be the very steep side of our mountain because our gradient uh, excuse me, our contour lines are close together. Whereas this side of the mountain is going to be very smooth, um, more gradual, because the contour lines are much further apart. So you have to cover a lot of distance here to get just one um, step up in contour. Whereas here, you cover a tiny amount to get to that same elevation. So here we go. Um, this mountain has a steeper slope in terms of this one's taller than this one. And you'll also see, like I said, that this side of the mountain is a lot steeper than this side where our contours are more spread out. So here is how we can calculate the gradient. So we can fairly easy just by eyeballing it, we can determine where it's going to be steeper, where it's going to be less steep, but something else that we can do is actually calculate the gradient. So we can, whoops, uh, we can put a number on it. So here, from x to y, we have a change in 
Um, 80 uh, units, I guess, kilometers. It's probably meters, but that's okay. Um, so it goes 300, and then our next uh, contour interval is 400. Excuse me, our next index contour is 400. And we have four contours in between. So we know it must be a change of 20. That's been a pretty common one throughout this PowerPoint, all my examples so far. So 300, 320, 340, 360, 380, 400. So our change in elevation is 80 from X to Y. And our change in distance, let's just round it and say it's two kilometers. So if you were to take this, put it right here, it's about two kilometers. So here we would have our change in elevation with distance. So we would say it is 80 over two. That would be our gradient. So here um, are some more examples of looking at our gradient and our slope. So here, these mountains are going to look much more similar than these two. So these two, I am hoping by now you will be able to tell me which one is taller and which side has the higher or the steeper slope. So I hope that you would all say this is the steeper slope where you have all the contours really close together because you're covering a short distance but you're increasing in elevation a lot. Whereas here, you're covering maybe about the same distance, but the elevation does not change nearly as much. Exactly. So when we look at our cute little um, cartoons here, we do see that these two are pretty similar. These two are very different. This side is much steeper. This mountain is taller than this side here, much more gradual. So when we uh, read a topographic map, there's a lot of uh, different things that you'll notice. You'll notice on this map, they do have our index contours, which are labeled, uh, which are thicker and labeled. So every five contours, they have these labels. We can also see um, our rivers are causing this U shape. So you'll notice there's these little U's in our rivers. You'll see a peak, so where you have a closed contour, that means it's the peak, so that's the highest point. There's nothing else higher. You'll also see um, a ridge line where you have sort of a very elongated peak. So here's a peak walking over to that other peak. Um, you don't change elevation much across because you're up on top of that, mid, um, of that ridge line. So I hope you're feeling a little more comfortable reading topographic maps. The tricky part, however, is drawing topographic maps. So when you're drawing topographic maps, you have to select uh, your contour interval. So you are the person drawing the map. You get to choose your contour interval. Uh, unless I tell you ahead of time what it should be, you get to choose. And then the goal is to draw smooth parallel contours and you label every single one. So for example, let's say this is in meters, you kind of connect the dots. So you find all the spots that are five uh, f meters. So five, 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 five. So you wanna separate everything that's less than five and everything that is greater than five in elevation. So you would draw your line something like this. Everything on one side of the line that you're drawing is less than five meters elevation. Everything on the other side is greater than five meters. So then you would draw your next contour line, which would be 10. Let's say we're going by five. So you would draw a line to separate everything on the left side of the line that I just outlined is larger than 10. Everything on the right side is um, lower than 10. You would also, let's see, so you would go like this, and then here's, uh, here is a 15. So we would need then to draw another line this way to say everything on one side of our 10 line is less, everything on the other side is more. So it's kind of like um, connect the dots. 
So the tricky thing is, is if you are trying to draw a 500 foot contour line, but you don't actually have any data points at 500 feet, you just interpolate in between. So between 501 and 495, 500 is going to fall a lot closer to 501 than it will to 495. So that's why this line is drawn closer to 501 than it is to 495. Uh, the same over here with 499, you know that your 500 foot contour is going to be pretty close to 499 and not all that close to 505. So it really is uh, connect the dots and you have to interpolate, you have to do your best guess as where the line would go when you don't actually have a data point at that value. So I have often drawn these little lines or um, cut the space between two points maybe into four pieces to make sure that my uh, contour line is correctly spaced between the two data points that I do have. So here's an example. So this guy that I was showing you before, here is now the actual drawn out uh, contour lines. So just like I was outlining, you can see that there's um, a line signifying everything at five meters elevation. There's a line at 10. Whoop. There's a line at 15, at 20, 25. So the highest point on this map is this peak here, which it says 26. So it's we know it's higher than 25 because it's circled, but it's not quite at 30 or else we'd have to have a 30 line. So generally you want your lines to be um, equidistant or parallel as much as possible, as much of course as the um, terrain allows for. So as you're walking, if you were, let's say in this location, walking from the coast up to this hill, you would be walking, uh, when you get to this point, you would have gained five meters elevation. Here, you would have gained another five meters elevation. You keep walking, you gained another five meters elevation. So what you're doing when you're drawing your contours is you're connecting the dots through the elevation points. So when we think about um, vertical profiles, it's really similar to how we did our uh, cross sections of our plate boundaries. So in this case, here's a cake. So it's like we're cutting into our cake and then we're seeing the layers beneath, you know? So here's the asthenosphere, the blue is maybe the lithosphere. Here we have our crust and our mountains. It looks delicious, now I'm craving cake. Um, when you guys are actually drawing your vertical profiles, what you do is you, choose a line or you're given a line, let's, let's say this is um, X over here and this is Y over here, and you're going to draw the line of how these, um, how the topography looks along this line. So if you were to walk from here over here, how, how, would, it, uh, how would the elevation change on your walk? So as you're walking, you know, you start here, it's going to be very steep because these contours are close together. And then you're going to be on the peak and then it's going to be very gradual because these contours are very far apart. So one thing you can actually do is when you're plotting later in your lab, remember this slide, um, you can uh, draw directly downwards and actually graph it out. So you can graph it perfectly like this um, it's not always going to be set up so perfect like this, so it doesn't have to be super perfect for this class, but you do want to make sure you have um, your slopes correctly, your gradient correct, and your peaks correct. So we know that this uh, peak here is somewhere, uh, somewhere in here is above 400 feet, but it's not any higher than 500 feet. Because if it was, we'd have to have a 500 foot circle. So when we drew, draw our actual vertical profile, so this green is the vertical profile, we don't draw this peak way, way up because we know it's not going to be any higher. So here is um, another suggestion. I found this figure. I really liked the way it showed you kind of step by step how to do this. So if you're, um, 
images, if your image isn't perfectly lined up, you can always do this where you take sort of another piece of paper and you uh, write out the different uh, contour lines that you cross along your profile. So here's our profile from A to A prime. You can take a little piece of paper and actually draw out the contours that you cross and then you can plot it. And now you have your vertical profile because you know that you uh, would walk up this little hill here, up this little hill. You would hit this uh, river valley, which is here, and then you'd go up rather gradually to A prime. So that is going to depend on the vertical scale that you draw here or that you choose here. Um, if you were to draw, choose a vertical scale that's too small, you might not be able to see anything. Um, you don't want it to be too exaggerated to the point where it looks like your peaks are gigantic. You just don't want to run out of paper. So when I um, give you maybe a blank version of this and there's no labels on the y-axis, you're going to want to make sure you choose labels that will allow you to draw both the highest peak and the lowest peak on the same graph. So this doesn't need to have a y-axis any lower than 140. This wouldn't have to go to zero. So you can crop it to whatever you need it to be, essentially. And then what I was talking, I, was, I think I just said um, exaggeration. So when we exaggerate our profile, what that means is we're just changing our vertical scale. So changing that vertical scale to be larger or smaller is going to make it either easier or harder to see our um, topographic features. So for example, in red, doesn't really look like you're doing much. It looks pretty flat because look how small our y-axis is in red. However, if we exaggerate it hugely and we say this whole distance is actually just 3, 8, 30, to 950 instead of here, which we're saying 830 to 1030 over just these two lines, we see, we see that uh, this actually is a big change when we exaggerate our y-axis. So oftentimes when you see topographic, um, excuse me, when you see vertical profiles, it will be exaggerated so that you can see what's going on. And usually a map would um, tell you that. So if we're looking at calculating how much our map has been exaggerated by, we need the two scales. So for example, we would do our horizontal scale divided by our vertical scale. So here we have our horizontal scale, which is um, like the, the scale bar that would be on the side of your map. It says one inch is equal to 5,000 feet. Cool. Vertical scale is different. So our vertical scale is one inch is equal to 200 feet. So we can write it out like this. We have our horizontal divided by our vertical. So our horizontal scale is 500 feet per inch. There are 500 feet in every inch. Our vertical scale is 200 feet per inch. So there's 200 feet in every inch. So that ends up, it's the same unit, so it's just 5,000 divided by 200, which is 25 times. So we can say that our vertical exaggeration is 25 times. This has been 25 times um, exaggerated, this map. So here's another example. This is a good one. I just wanted to put it here because when you're drawing, it might be very helpful. Um, for your lab today, you're going to be doing the week 11 lab, topographic maps. Um, you're going to need the maps file. So this can be found by clicking the resources button. So let me show you if I can get out of this PowerPoint. There we go. So you want to choose uh, the resources button, which is here. So week 11, part one, topographic maps, your resources button should just download, yes, so this is going to download the maps that you need, if it will open, here we go. So these are the, the two pages that you're gonna need for your lab, notice there's no vertical, um, there's no y-axis labeled, that's why I went over that. <laughs> um, so if we go back, my, so for the lab, there's a couple things you're gonna have to do, but at one point you're gonna have to draw on this page. 
So you may either print this and draw on it and then scan it to me or just take a picture with your phone and submit that on Canvas or you can draw on this digitally. So if you don't have a printer, don't worry. You can just draw on this digitally. Um, one thing you could do, I know on a Mac, you can just open and preview and edit sort of with the little scribble pen, but um, you can also open it in PowerPoint. So you can actually open in PowerPoint and then look for the scribble marker. Actually, I can show you right now. So in insert and then shapes, you can do your scribble and then you can draw all over whatever it is. So you can open that PDF in PowerPoint, you can draw on it, you can scribble. I suggest doing, so now I can, let me see if I can delete it without deleting the slide. So I suggest when you're doing this, if you do it digitally, to do many small marks. Don't try and do everything all at once. Um, that way you can easily sort of erase and edit. Um, if you're gonna print it out, I hugely suggest pencil. Um, you will need to erase. Even when I do this, and I've done this one a bunch of times now, um, I always end up erasing and deleting things. So that is my suggestion. Um, please be sure to post questions, um, suggestions, anything in the discussion board so I can see them. Again, of course, feel free to answer each other, reach out to your lab partners, and I will check on the discussion board as well. So good luck with the lab, and I will uh, talk to you for the next lecture. Bye.